introduction, Mason. I appreciate that. Okay, so let's share the screen. Okay, so, so what is a shark? So we have lots of animals that we call sharks, but they aren't necessarily what would be considered a true shark. So a shark is a member of the class chondrichthys, which are the cartilaginous fish. And from there, they're a member of the subclass lasmobranchi, which are essentially the chondrichthians that their jaws are not fused to their brain case. They're in the infraclass eucilachi, which are the neosilations plus the hybodoniforms, which are an extinct group of sharks or shark-like chondrichthians, as well as a basal group called the protoacridoniforms. So from there, they're in the division neosilachi, which they are um, the salations. So the salations are the true sharks. And within neosilachi are the batoids as well, which are the modern rays and skates and all of those. Those used to be considered highly derived sharks, meaning they split off from the shark lineage. However, this has been proven incorrect due to genomic testing, which has actually shown that they're sister group to sharks. So a few examples of non-shark chondrichthians, you have helicoprion, which is that famous whirl tooth, as well as stethacanthus, which has that spiny brush. This was my favorite chondrichthian as a kid as well as the reef manta ray. Three examples of true sharks are the Japanese angel shark, Squatina japonica, the whale shark, which is right under it, and a cardiobiodon venator. So you can kind of see why people thought that rays were derived from sharks as you have a flat body plan with Squatina as well as the rays. However, this is, this is called the hypnosqualian hypothesis, though as it's been proven incorrect. Scientists have tried to find out when they diverged, though there is a lot of discrepancy with this. They've estimated that they diverged anywhere from the late Carboniferous at around 306 million years ago uh, to as close as the late Triassic around 213 million years ago. So shark origins. So the first chondrichthian-like scale, so the first cartilaginous fish scales that we know of originate in Australia, and these are at the middle Ordovician, whereas the earliest teeth that we find of chondrichthians are in the lower Devonian with Leonotus carlsi and Celdebrina materi. And so the chondrichthians are much older than the stem group of neosilations. Neosilations we don't find till much later in the Paleozoic in the Carboniferous. So specifically the Mississippians or the early Carboniferous. And the first group that we find within the Neosilations are Culiella 40 and their kin, which are in the group Anachronicidae. These are described as sharks, mainly due to their crown and root morphology, specifically the vascularization or these pores, if you can see on the picture. So these are a really derived trait that other uh, chondrichthians from the Paleozoic don't really have. Below it is Gintaria fungiforma, which is another chondrichthian or another anachronistid shark. These aren't true sharks yet because we have uh, a single layer of enameloid, which if you don't know, histology is a major technique that paleontologists use to differentiate groups of fossil sharks. Since we don't have many body fossils, we really rely on this for a lot of um, taxonomic placement. So these have a single layer of enamloid, which is also present in batoids, the rays, although some rays do have a double layer, whereas sharks have a synapomorphy, which means a derived trait of three enamloid layers, and this is unique within sharks. But it is, it is important to mention that most likely their ancestors did have this single enamloid layer. So within Anachronicidae, you had a subfamily that's recently described. You have Amarodontis centusi from the Carboniferous of Grand Canyon, 
which is really just mind boggling to think that the Grand Canyon at one point was underwater. But yeah, so these look more shark-like than most other animals from the Paleozoic. You have lateral cusp splits, so these mini teeth-like projections on the side of the tooth, and a pretty derived, so a pretty advanced root structure. And below it is a undescribed genus and species from this same subfamily. This is a anachronicity indeterminate. That's what INDET stands for from the early Carboniferous of the Moscow region of Russia. And if you look at this, this looks like a shark tooth. Like you can see teeth that are pretty similar to this within the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. But again, this still has just that one enamyloid layer. So this brings us to our first order of sharks that appear in the fossil record. These are the Synecodoniforms. These appear in the early Permian and exist all the way throughout the Paleocene. These have really crazy looking teeth. The earliest described tooth would be Synecodus antiquus, which is from the early Permian of Russia. And note on the labial side, so the side of the tooth that faces outwards in the jaw. So the display side that most collectors tend to put their teeth in is the lingual side, but this is actually the back of the tooth. So the front of the tooth right here, you can see these nutrient grooves um, along the basal side of the root. And this is a unique trait that is amongst Synecodoniforms as well as some other enigmatic sharks that we'll get into later. But Synecodoniforms are somewhat of a mystery. They've been placed into multiple different taxonomic positions. They've been placed within gallimorph sharks, squalomorph sharks, which I'll get into what those are later. They've also been placed as stem neosalations. However, I don't find this to be the case most likely as they have that highly derived triple layered enamyloid that is really only present in true sharks. So it makes more sense that these would have derived, that these would already have derived into the true shark group. So in the Triassic is really when you start seeing these sharks diverge. You see much more diversity in the Triassic for Synecodoniforms. One example is Romferodon nicolensis. This tooth is from the late Triassic, the Norian of St. Nicholas de Port in France. This actually comes from the type locality. You also find Synecodus riaticus from the late Triassic. This tooth is from England. But it's interesting to note morphologically, so like the physical appearance of the tooth, as well as histological, so the um, microstructures of tissues, particularly the enamyloid, are very different on this than your standard Synecodus teeth, like this one over here, which is from the um, early Cretaceous of France. So Synecodus is most likely a polyphyletic taxa which means that you have a composite group of organisms that do not share a common ancestor. And I just wanna say that Synecodus have wild looking teeth. If you can see this one from the Cretaceous of France, all of those lateral cusplets, it's just a really bizarre, bizarre tooth. And over here we have an articulated skeleton also from France. So we do find in the Triassic some other early stem stellations. These are even more so enigmatic. One such shark is Duffin Salachi holwellensis. This used to be thought of as an extinct order of sharks known as hybodoniforms because morphologically they look very similar. So this was placed under the, um, the genus Polyacrotus. However, we found through histology tests that this is actually a true shark. This has that three-layered enamyloid. This tooth is from the late Triassic of Somerset, England. This particular locality does have a lot of these enigmatic sharks and is one of my personal favorites for micros. Most of these teeth that you're seeing here, these early sharks, they're not much more than a millimeter or two in length. So <laughs> these are not to scale. Another small enigmatic shark is Pseudocedronis pick 40, 
which used to be thought of as a cedarinid, which is related to the basking shark, which is a very large filter feeder that's still around today. However, this is most likely just due to convergence, and this is a primitive early salation. Two other examples of these early sharks include Rhymelotus buterovi from the Middle Triassic of Bulgaria, as well as Raphia minuta from the Triassic of Germany. But it's interesting to note these only have that two enamelloid layers, which is worth noting because while we like to say that true sharks all have this triple layered enamelloid, it's really in practice hard to test because the enamelloid structures, it's not true layers per se, as much as it is different, um, different gradients that interwine with each other. So the term triple layered enamelloid is a little misleading, but it's the best term that we have for now. So we continue to use this in paleontology. But anyways, through testing this, you can have um, degradation of the enamelloid through the acid prep that it takes to do this, as well as just um, preservation of the tooth in general can obscure this. But morphologically, meaning the physical attributes of these teeth do look like your true sharks. So in the early Jurassic, we have the rise of the crown group sharks. So these are the sharks that you would pretty much recognize as sharks today. They're split up into two super orders, the galliomorphs, which are the gallian sharks, and the squalomorphs, which are the squalian sharks. And if you look at this phylogenetic tree, so this is how we like to classify organisms and their relationships with each other. The galliomorphs and squalomorphs are sister taxa to each other, whereas batoids are sister to all sharks in general, rather than being highly derived squalian sharks, which is what used to be proposed in the hypnosqualian hypothesis. Down here is a stem galliomorph, a gallius dorsitensis. This is from the early Jurassic of England, and this is one of my favorite shark species, just a really strange animal. So the first, the most basal order, so the least derived order within galliomorphy are the heterodoniforms. These are from the early Jurassic all the way through recent. Their common names are the horn sharks and the bullhead sharks. And these are really adorable looking animals, as you can see here. This is the zebra bullhead shark and the Port Jackson shark. But what's really interesting about these sharks is that they have a what's called a heterodont dentition, meaning they have different shaped teeth in one part of the jaw than they do in the other. They have more of a clutching style tooth in the anterior, which is up towards the front, whereas more posteriorly, so towards the back, they have more of a grinding or crushing type dentition. An example of these teeth include Procestracean semirugosis from the late Jurassic of England right here, which looks very similar to the anterior teeth on this heterodontus, as well as a crushing tooth of heterodontus from the late Cretaceous of Russia, which would fit in more posteriorly in the jaw. Up here is an articulated skeleton of Paracestracian falcifer, a early heterodontiform. This is from the late Jurassic of Solnhofen, Germany. Solnhofen and the related localities in Germany are known as Lagerstaden, which are exceptional localities when it comes to preserving these articulated remains, even soft tissue preservation. So you really don't see much preserved as far as articulated skeletons with sharks, because since they're cartilaginous rather than bony, it's much harder comparatively to preserve in the fossil record, whereas their teeth do preserve very well. And since they replace teeth throughout their lives, that's why they are so common within the fossil record. What's also interesting is heterodontus is one of the only sharks known that has a two-layered enamelloid on the lateral teeth, which means that they lost it secondarily while their interior teeth have the standard three layers. So the next order we will talk about are the rectiloboforms. These are also present in the early Jurassic through now. Their common names are the carpet sharks. And these are actually found earlier in the fossil record than heterodontiforms, though this is most likely just sample biasing 
as some of these Mesozoic localities are just much harder to come by, especially Triassic and Jurassic ones, which is why we have a lot of enigmatic animals from this time period. So some modern examples of erectiloboforms include the zebra shark, Stegosoma tigrinum, the spotted wabagong, the tawny nurse shark, and the brown banded bamboo shark. So these vary greatly in size. These bamboo sharks, Chiloscillium, they are quite small, whereas the largest living shark on Earth is the whale shark, Rhynchodon typus, which belongs within the Erectiloboforms. And it's interesting because the largest shark is also a filter feeder. So it's just, it's just a weird contrast. But anyways, over here we have Forsinus catalina, which is from the late Jurassic of Germany. This is an extinct early erectiloboform. And they have really fascinating teeth. So they have a diverse set of teeth, but most of them tend to have what we call a labial apron on the crown, which is this, this jutting out part of the crown of the tooth. You can see that in all of these. Although this is convergently found in some other sharks that we'll see later, but it's a very common trait within the erectiloboforms. This is a bamboo shark tooth, a Chiloscillium greeny from the late Cretaceous of France. These are tiny teeth. These aren't more than a couple millimeters in length. Brachylurus wadi. So this is a blind shark tooth from the late Pliocene of Chile. This is your typical nurse shark tooth, Ganglimastoma from the Miocene of Bone Valley, Florida. These are quite hard to find in Florida, although they are found elsewhere throughout the world. We have Erectilobus. This is a Wabagong shark tooth from the Miocene of Australia. And these are quite hard. You don't find much of these within the fossil record, at least that's recorded. And convergently, they look quite similar to some Squatina teeth. This one, not as much because this is an anterior, but the lateral teeth and the posterior teeth look very much like Squatina. So it can be hard to differentiate them from this locality. And lastly, we have Rhynchodon typus, so a whale shark tooth. You can find these in Maryland. This is from the Miocene of Brownies Beach. Although you will most likely have to do some sort of micro screening to find these because as they're massive sharks, they have teeth that regressed in size because they don't need them as much like some of these other predatory sharks do. So the next order that we have within the Gallimorphs are the Carcharinoforms. These are present from the middle Jurassic through recent and their common name are the Requiem sharks. And I would argue that these are the most successful order of sharks that are alive today. They are exceptional generalists, meaning they can fit in most niches that they want to. And a prime example of this is the tiger shark, Gallocerdo cuvier. This is one of the most dangerous sharks on the planet, but they have, they are just very well adapted to their environments and they have a cosmopolitan distribution, meaning they are around the world. You also have an extant species of snaggletooth, the Hemipristis elongata, which you can find lots of Hemipristis teeth throughout Maryland, as well as elsewhere in the Miocene and Pliocene. However, they are much larger than what these modern sharks are. And these are more so restricted than they were before as far as geographic range but they still do exist and they still have that signature snaggle tooth type shape. One of the oddest carcharinoforms is the hammerheads, the hammerheads with the great hammerhead being the largest species. And they have just that iconic flattened out head that goes out on both directions laterally, which is just really, really one of those <laughs> most bizarre traits that I feel like has evolved within the shark, within sharks as a whole. Above here is a articulated skeleton of Gallerinus cuvieri. This is from the Eocene of Italy. And this would be related to the modern day taupe shark or a school shark, whatever most people like calling them either. So the false cat shark, this ugly shark right here is also a carcharinoform. Earlier carcharinoforms tended to be more scalarinid, which is more like cat sharks than um, carcharinids, which are like the tiger sharks. 
But right now, these are really where we have the most success as far as shark lineages go, the carcharinids. Some examples of teeth from this order include Galliceratocuvier. cuvier. So this is your tiger shark tooth. These have serrations on serrations and a really distinct tooth morphology or shape. This is from the late Pliocene through early Pleistocene of North Central Java, Indonesia, which is a little bit more recent geologically of a locality than where you find all of those megalodon teeth from West Java. Next to it is a Glyphus gangeticus lower tooth. This is from the Ganges shark, which is a rare shark, and they are considered a true river shark, meaning that they can inhabit freshwater river territories. This is from the same locality as the tiger shark. We have a juvenile hemipristis serratooth from the late Miocene of West Java, Indonesia. Now these are, you can tell apart juveniles outside of size from this more straight, um, this more straight edge compared to a more adult um, hemipristis serra, which will have a more jagged edge on this side. But you still have that characteristic snaggle tooth over here. This is the mesial side. So this would be the side that faces towards the anterior, whereas the distal side faces away. We have the Carcharhinus lucus. This is your bull shark tooth, which can also inhabit freshwater territories. And this is kind of your basic body plan for most Carcharhinid teeth. Just that more flat, serrated, um, generalist type cutting dentition. We have Gallerinus galeus over here, which is from the late Miocene of Australia. This is your taupe shark, which has these really cool cusplet type serrated um, edges right here. And lastly, pictured is a mega Gallerinus myrcenicus, which is essentially like a mega sized Gallerinid, so a large cat shark like shark. The last extant order, so the last living order of gallimorph sharks are the lomniforms. These are present from the middle Jurassic all the way through today. And when you think of a shark, you are most likely thinking about a lomniform. They're commonly called the mackerel sharks and modern ones have a whole host of weird specializations such as the goblin shark with that elongated rostrum and those protruding jaws. You have the threshers, which have that elongated caudal fin or tail fin. This is a pelagic thresher right here. We have the mega mouth shark, which is a large filter feeder shark, kind of like rinkadon, except these are lamniforms. And these were only until relatively recently thought of to be an extinct taxa until somebody caught them in the 1900s. We have the great white shark, the most iconic shark of all time, is a lomniform. This has that classic lomniform type body shape, that more spindle shape. And sharks, lomniforms do not always look like this. We have the earliest known lomniform, Paleocarcarius stromeri, which is a more benthic style shark, meaning that it would have lived more by the ocean floor. It was a little bit flatter. So morphologically, it looks very different than these sharks. So why do we consider this a lomniform? The answer again lies in histology, but this time with the crown. So shark teeth tend to have three main histotypes for their crown, which is a orthodont histotype, pseudo-osteodont histotype, and osteodont histotype. Osteodont teeth are only found that we know of within the order lomniforms. And through histology tests of Paleocarcarius, we do find that um, osteodont histotype. So these are lomniform sharks. In the Jurassic, there that's the only species or the only genus that we really know of. And throughout the early Cretaceous, they aren't that numerous either. Granted, there are very few early, early Cretaceous localities that we can find teeth. Mostly they're restricted in Europe. But from we, what we know, they're not very diverse at this time. They're primarily related to Pseudoscopinorhynchidae, which is like this protolamna tooth. 
And it isn't until the end of the early Cretaceous in the Albion stage that these real lamniforms really take off. So in the, in the Albion, you see your Cretaxyrhina coming through. You see the Cartabiodon today. You see a weird shark like this, Pricerus macariza, which are really just strange. Their labia or their more uh, messy or distally compressed, meaning they're side to side compressed. They have elongated root lobes and they have a large hump in the lingual side of the, of the root. So this side right here, it's hard to tell in this picture though. In the Cretaceous, you also see your standard mackerel shark type dentition, which when you think of a mackerel shark, you're most likely thinking of a tooth like this, which is Archaeolamna copingensis. This is from the late Cretaceous of Mississippi, where it has a principal cusp, so one main cusp with two lateral cusplets on the sides. You see this tooth a lot in other taxa, such as Duardius and Cartabiodon, in Otodus, Megalolamna. This is a very common lamniform tooth type. In the Cretaceous, you also find very abundantly two squalocorax or the anacrasids. <clears throat> this is squalocorax hartwilli from the late Cretaceous of Kansas. And if you'll notice, this is quite similar in morphology to the Carcharhinus teeth. This has serrated edges. It's a lot flatter than some other lamniforms, but this is due to convergence and evolution. So these traits evolved independently from one another throughout those taxa. A really strange anacrasid is Tychocorax alaticus, which it has anterior teeth very similar to a squalocorax species called squalocorax yangaensis. However, the more laterally you go in the dentition, they have weird teeth like this, where it's got a crushing type occlusal or chewing surface, but it also has a blade on it and an apex or a tip. But when you get towards the posterior of the jaw, these are just crushing teeth. So it's another weird heterodont dentition. You see lots of heterodont cell dentitions within the order lamniforms. One of the strangest is Xiphodolamia. Xiphodolamia has anterior teeth like this, that only have one cutting edge, which is something you really don't see in any other shark taxa. They are mesiodistally compressed, meaning again, side to side or laterally compressed. And anterior or lateral teeth, so the teeth next to these, would have still be compressed like that. However, they have two cutting edges. And lastly, you have a more triangular shape on their lateral teeth. They're very, um, labiolingually compressed, so they're very flat. This is Xiphodolamia serrata, so this is the last Xiphodolamia species before becoming extinct. And this is from the late Eocene of Western Sahara region in Morocco. These are differentiated by their serrated edges or edge on this tooth in particular. What's interesting to note is that serrations, while they evolve independently several times in lamniform lineages, a lot of times when a lamniform develops serrations, it dies off shortly after, which you see within Xiphodolamia serrata. You also see that with Paleocarcharodon, with a shark called Carcharoides totus serratus, which is a sand shark, an extinct sand shark. And you see it with the giant threshers. So this is Alopius platyci from the Miocene of Virginia. This is a beautiful tooth, by the way. These are probably one of the most sought after lamniform teeth or teeth in general. But these developed from the giant thresher, Alopius grandis. However, they have serrations and we can actually track down the transition between serrations. With this, we can find transitional teeth of Alopius transitioning into palatocy. You can see these transitions in a lot of lamniform lineages which is interesting because they're quite rare in the grand scheme of the fossil record. You very rarely see transitional specimens. However, at the lamniforms, you can see them quite clearly. One such example of these transitions is Carcardon hastalis, 
This tooth right here is from the middle Miocene of Sharktooth Hill, California. This site is near Bakersfield and is world renowned for these colorations, which is just exquisite. But this is the evolutionary ancestor to the great white shark, Carcardon carcarius. We can find transitional teeth from Carcardon carcarius going, or from Carcardon hastalis going into Carcardon carcarius. These are known as Carcardon hubeli or hubeli. And essentially, the transition goes from a unserrated blade like this all the way through ripple marks towards the base of the crown, all the way towards a finely serrated crown in Carcardon carcarius. Uh, contrary to what you might see on Facebook and online, these are not Mako shark teeth. If these were Makos, you would have to call um, the great white a Mako as well, which I don't think we're prepared to do. And lastly, what lomniform group would be complete without Carcarcles megalodon, which is the largest macro predatory shark to have ever lived? This tooth right here is from Cuba. I personally prefer using Carcarcles over um, Otodus for Megalodon, even though Otodus is, the, is what's used mostly through both academics and enthusiasts alike. My reasoning for this mainly is due to paraphily, which if you don't know, that is one, that is a group, an ancestor plus some descendants, but not all. So Peritotus most likely also diverged from Otodus meaning that if you change Carcarcles megalodon to Otodus and you wanted to maintain monophyly, which is a full clade of Otodus, you would have to also change Peritotus, Benetoni, and its ancestors to Otodus as well. But I think that these are morphologically different enough to warrant the split amongst the genera. Another thing too is that um, Credilomna is paraphyletic as well. So this is one of the big issues that we have with taxonomy and with uh, fossils is that we have Credilomna that exists in the Paleocene while it also splits off into Otodus as well as Paleocarcharodon. So since it doesn't itself become extinct, that would make a paraphile. But it's important to remember that some paraphiles are natural and justified as in a shark doesn't die off while splitting off into another uh, group of species. But we want to eliminate the unjust paraphily, which I believe splitting Carcarcles megalodon into Otodus would have. So moving on, now we have, let's see, the last order of gallimorph sharks, which are the tychodontiforms. These have been placed pretty much everywhere within the phylogenetic tree of chondrichthians. These have been considered either hybodoniforms, batoids, so rays, or sharks, lomniforms, pretty much everything. The reasoning for this was for a long time, we thought that, this had a, that they had a single layer of enamyloid. However, recent studies have shown that they actually do have a three-layered enamyloid structure meaning that they are true sharks. And in addition to this, their vertebrae are very much indicative that they are galliomorph sharks. One thing to note is I wouldn't be so hasty to lump these within lamniforms due to the fact that they have pseudo-osteodont type teeth, which you do have one lamniform taxa that is known to have this, which is Cedarinus, the basking shark, but it's still not common. And I would rather be tentative rather than lumping something in with another thing that may not be justified. So I would place this within Gallimorphy for now. But these are commonly known as the crusher sharks. They're from the early Cretaceous through the late Cretaceous. We have a upper jaw tooth plate right here from Tychotis mordenai. This is found in the Smoky Hill Chalk of Kansas which is a famous Cretaceous locality within the Western Interior Seaway. So if you didn't know, much of the middle of the U.S. was actually covered by an ocean or by a seaway during the Cretaceous. These teeth got big. So here's a Tychotis mordenai tooth from the late Cretaceous of Alabama, but you could find fist-sized Tychotis teeth, 
which would have been a very large shark. These would have fed upon um, shelled invertebrates. So they are duraphagous. Over here is a symphysial tooth of Tychotus anonymous from the late Cretaceous of Texas. So if you don't know what a symphysial tooth is, it's essentially in the center of the jaw. Note the puffed out root structure on this. That is indicative of a symphysial tychotis tooth. And you can compare that with the symphysials right here on this tooth plate that they match up pretty well. So now we're into the squalomorphs, which are sister to the gallimorphs, the most basal or ancestral slash least derived group, least derived would be more accurate than ancestral, are the order hexanciforms. These are from the early Jurassic through recent, and they're further split up into two suborders. You have the hexanchoids, which are the cow sharks, and you have the chlamydosalatoids, which are the frilled sharks. You have uh, the broad nose seven gill shark right here, which they belong to the genus Notorhynchus as well as the blunt nose six gill, which are in Hexanchus. The frill shark, you have Clemeter salacius and Guineus. These are all very primitive looking sharks. They're known for having more than five pairs of gill slits. So um, you have six or seven. They're the only known sharks that have this with the exception of one that we will look at later on. They also only have one dorsal fin. They, most sharks tend to have two with the exception of the one fin cat shark that belongs into the carcariniforms, though this is just due to convergence. So these teeth kind of have a cult following amongst collectors. The hexanchoids have a very distinct tooth design. This is a lower tooth of hexanchus agassizi from the early Eocene of England. They have one primary cone or an acrocone, and then you have these accessory cones that follow it, and they form a very saw-like shaped tooth. These are very labiolingually compressed, meaning flat teeth. However, the early Jurassic teeth were not so much. Over here, we have a heptranchius howley tooth from the middle through late Eocene of Mangishlak, Kazakhstan. This is an upper tooth and these, this is kind of related to the sharp nose seven gill that still is alive today. These are quite rare teeth as they are more of a deep water species. We have a Cretaceous taxa, Gladius serratus species, which is from the late Cretaceous of Russia. And lastly, a Hexanchius griseus tooth, so a modern six gill tooth from the late Pliocene of Chile. The symphysial teeth are very um, sought after due to this unique shape that they have. You really don't see anything else like this. And it's worth noting that symphysial teeth tend to be more uncommon in the fossil record than most other tooth positions due to in many taxa, not necessarily Hexanchius. They tend to be smaller teeth and they tend now to get lost during feeding as well as the sharks just having less of them. So you have the chlamydosalatoids next, which have, in my opinion, even more fascinating teeth. These are reminiscent of the Paleozoic sharks, the or chondrichthians, not true sharks, the cladodonts with these prong-like cusps. Chlamydosalatoids has intermediate cusplets as well this is Chlamydia salacious brackery from the Miocene of Austria. And these are extremely rare sharks to find fossil of, mainly because these are again, deep water species. And they're also quite fragile as well. Recently in the late companion of Hornby Island, we described a, a shark called Dicheus garethi, which is essentially a Chlamydia salacious on steroids. This was a frill shark the size of a great white, which is a scary thought to think about. These have very elongated prongs or cusps. And note also the root structure of chlamydia salatoids. They are very, um, they're very protruding out lingually. So on this side, 
And they have these two notches as well, which is to help the teeth interlock with each other in the jaw. It's important to note as well that hexanchoids and clematosalatroids are sister to each other through genetic tests. So that gets us into the next slide, which are hexanchiforms or synechodoniforms. These are just very obscure teeth in general and have proven to be very controversial. So we have pseudonotodanus here and welcomia, which have, which have cow shark-like crowns, especially welcomia. However, they have root structures along with paraorthocotus and spinotus that have those labial ridges or nutrient grooves, which this is known as the pseudopolyalacarize root structure. But anyways, these are um, initially thought of to just be from synechodoniforms. So these morphologically look kind of like hybrids between them. However, histology has shown that um, Welcomia, as well as early hexanchiforms, their tooth histology, the um, enameloid histology is very similar to paraorthocotus as well as spinotus. And we've found body fossils of paraorthocotus and these only have one, these only have one dorsal fin and it's towards the caudal fin, which is the tail fin, which is a trait that is really, again, only found so much within the hexanchiforms. So this is indicative that these are actually hexanchiforms. In addition to this, spinotus and paraorthocotus have placoid scales or dermal denticles that are very similar to hexanchiforms to the point where uh, paleontologists such as Henry Capetta have grouped them together within the hexanchiforms. Synechodoniforms have two dorsal fins. They are lacking fin spines, but I think that that is evidence enough to differentiate these. Although it is important it is interesting that Pseudonotodanus has been known to have two dorsal fins with fin spines. So there is definitely some revision, in my opinion, that needs to be done within these controversial sharks. Another obscure shark is Camoxidon quuthjiketh. This is from the late Cretaceous of Hornby Island, Canada as well. And this has a spinotus-like crown like this. However, it has these lateral cusplets, though you can sometimes find spinotus with this, it's not common. But most importantly, the root structure is very similar to that of chlamydosalatroids, where it protrudes out very much so lingually with these notches, where these interlock in a similar way that a chlamydosalatroid type jaw would. Which, I don't know, this could be evidence that spin that Clemeter salatroids evolved from a spinotus like ancestor. It is possible. And I think that further investigation needs to be done with these. Paraorthocotus clarki, by the way, is in my opinion, one of the coolest sharks that you can find in Maryland. This, these are found in the Paleocene. This spinotus right here is from the late Jurassic of Switzerland. These are related to paraorthocotus, though they are in different families. And they, these are quite rare to find preserved with their root lobes. So it's, I don't know, the, these are really cool teeth, in my opinion. Next up, we have an extinct order of squalomorph sharks, known as the protospinacaforms. These are from the early Jurassic through the early Cretaceous. They have no extant or living relatives. These are, this is a articulated skeleton of protospinax anectens from the late Jurassic of Germany. These were flat, more benthic-like sharks. And we also have a tooth of this, protospinax planus, from the late Jurassic of England. These teeth look convergently like batoids. However, this is, again, just convergence, and these are actually true sharks. So next up are the within squalomorphy are the squatiniforms. These are from the late Jurassic through recent, and their common name are the angel sharks. Right here we have a modern angel shark called the sand devil, Squatina dermeral. Their teeth 
tend to be very similar from one species to another to the point where we can't really reliably identify them on a species level basis, which is why the paleo species or the extinct species tend to be classified based on age, geologic age, as well as maybe sometimes um, geographic distribution. But you can find these in Maryland. This is a Squatina subserrata from the Miocene of Brownies Beach. And notice also here that a labial apron on the crown, which is reminiscent of erectiloba forms. But again, this is just due to convergence. We have a Squatina hassi from the late Cretaceous of New Jersey, a state nearby you guys. And this was a personal find of mine actually. And I was really happy to sift this thing out. Here is a stem Squatina form. This is Pseudorhina acanthoderma. This is from the late Jurassic of Germany. And we have a tooth of this genus right here, Pseudorhina. This is a new species, an undescribed species. And this tooth actually comes from the type specimen. And these have a really pronounced labial apron right there. But this is also from Solnhof in Germany. So after that, we have the order Prisciforiforms. These are from the late Cretaceous through recent. Though one has been described from the early Cretaceous, it hasn't been accurately documented nor figured. So I would be apprehensive as to put these within the early Cretaceous. So to be safe, I'm going to say late Cretaceous through recent. These are the saw sharks. And these are very fascinating in that they develop this elongated rostrum that has these rostral spines, such as this one from the Miocene of Australia, just aligning the edges of the rostrum. We have two extant genera. We have Prisciforus, which are the saw sharks, as well as Pliotrema, which are the six gill saw sharks. These are the only other sharks outside of Hexanka forms that have um, five or more gill slit pairs, or more than five gill, so gill slit pairs, as I should say. The oral teeth, so the true teeth, are quite rare within the fossil record. However, you can maybe find these through micro screening and stuff like that. This is an oral tooth from the Pliocene of Chile. And sawfish and sclerorhynchoids are not true sharks. So this, this elongated rostrum with these rostral spines appears during due to convergence a few different times, which is very, which is just mind boggling that this would evolve through separate lineages. But anyways, sawfish and sclerorhynchoids are, they are batoids rather than salations. One way that you can tell apart batoids from sharks is the batoids have gills ventrally, so on the underside, whereas sharks have them to the side. Their fin attachments are also different. Batoids have their pectoral fins that attach towards the cranium, whereas with sharks, they attach behind the cranium. So sawfish and sclerorhynchoids both evolved convergently as well from each other, so not through the same lineage, but they both derived from rhinobatoids, which are a guitar fish-like ancestor. What's also interesting to note is that all sharks have a osteodentine type root structure. Batoids don't though, they have orthodont. However, saw sharks are the only shark um, taxa that do have an orthodont root structure. So not only did they develop these rostrum during convert due to convergence, but even their teeth evolved similarly due to convergence. After that, we have the order Echinorhiniforms. These are somewhat controversial as well, as morphologically, these have been placed for a long time within squaliforms, which we'll get to next. However, they are genetically known to be linked closer to the squatina forms and Prisciophore forms. We have the prickly shark here, Echinorhinus cookie, as well as the bramble shark, Echinorhinus brucus. Their teeth are quite interesting as well. They're very flat, so labiolingually compressed. This is an Echinorhinus lapoi tooth from the late Cretaceous of Hornby Island, Canada. And a more recent tooth, a Echinorhinus blakey, from the middle Miocene of Sharktooth Hill, California. 
this these are quite fragile teeth so it's very hard to find these perfect as well as they just aren't very common especially at shark tooth hill they're quite rare find and last up we have the order squaliforms within the squalomorphy these exist in the early cretaceous through recent these are found a little bit later in the early cretaceous than the echinorhinoforms echinorhinoforms are found in the velanginian whereas these are from the Baremian and onwards these are commonly known as the dogfish sharks, and they are probably the most diverse group of sharks within the squalomorphs. And one such example of these weird <laughs> specializations is the viper dogfish, Trigonognathus cabii. Look at those protruding out jaws and those fang-like teeth. These are also bioluminescent. So within squal the squaliforms, photophores have evolved which essentially mean that these are light producing organs, which is a really, really just fascinating trait that some of these deep water squaliforms have. Another example of a squaliform is the cookie cutter shark, Isistius brasiliensis. These have teeth that are, um, they're kind of like a conveyor belt. They are attached, interlocked um, laterally. And these produce those circular chunks out of their prey that give them the name cookie cutter shark. And then lastly, we have the Greenland shark pictured here, Somniosis microcephalus, which is a massive squaliform that these are actually known to be the longest living vertebrates with some of them approaching 400 years in age. And lastly, here are some teeth of squaliforms. They have some very obscure teeth that are very unique within this order. An early squaliform, Protosqualus sigi, this is from the Albion of England, which is a little bit similar to the um, dogfish teeth, such as this Squalus occidentalis. This is from the Middle Miocene of Shark Tooth Hill, California, another personal find of mine. Some of the more unique Squaliform teeth include those of um, Squaliolus. This is Squaliolus shauby, which is a extinct pygmy shark. So these are tiny teeth. These are around a millimeter or so in length. Most of these um, and related taxa have um, lower teeth that are very labiolingually compressed, so they're very flat. We have an upper tooth right here of Deania calcia, which is the bird beak dogfish. Squaliforms tend to have a, a part of heterodonty, so they have different teeth in the upper versus lower jaws. So this is an upper tooth, whereas their lower teeth tend to look a little bit more like Centrophorus, which this is a lower tooth of Centrophorus from the Miocene of Portland, Victoria, Australia. And lastly is a tooth of Deladius Lycha from the late Pliocene through early Pleistocene of North Central Java, Indonesia. This is one of my favorite teeth. This comes from the Kaifin shark, which, is also, which also has bioluminescence. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. So if you all have any questions, I can answer them. Let's see. Hey, Ben. Um, that was great. Okay. Wait, hold on. Uh, this is Bronwyn right now. Can we come uh, uh, unshare and come back together and then we'll do questions yeah. and answers? Okay. Yeah. And if, if, if you have a question for Ben, please raise your hand and I will um, acknowledge you and then you can unmute or you can put it into the chat box. I know that Mason's been curating the chat box as we've been going on. So if there's somebody who has a question, just raise your hand and I'll let you do it. Rodney, go ahead. Hello, so Paraurthicotus, that is now considered a hexanchoform. So it is debated. So you have some paleontologists such as Henry Capetta that do consider these hexanchoforms. However, some paleontologists still consider them within the Senecodoniforms. Okay, the last book that I had was, for, was Kent's book, uh, The mm -hmm. Fossil Sharks of the Chesapeake Bay, and it was the Sharks of Uncertain Affinity. That was 1995, so. Yeah, yeah I mean, they still are pretty enigmatic. 
So mm-hmm. there is still conflicting evidence because they have that pseudo polyalacrylic root structure. So like those labial nutrient mm-hmm. grooves. However, I do consider them to be hexanchiforms due to overall morphology. Okay, and where was the full body? Sure. So the, the full body has been found in Solnhofen or related localities like that. Okay. Yeah, so they would be Jurassic, so they would be older than what you find in the Paleocene. Okay, okay, great, mm-hmm. thank you. No problem. Uh, so we have a question in chat from uh, Nick Gardner, uh, who asks, what does it mean for a shark to be a galleon or squallion shark? So like, what's the difference between those two groups? So really, the biggest difference is just um, phylogenetically or genomically. So you would have them separated out into two distinct clades. And this has been proven through several tests. People tend to call the squalomorph sharks more um, primitive. However, they still are, you know, equally derived as their sister to the gallimorph sharks. But really, it just comes down to genetics. Uh, Isat asks, what are the uh, evolutionary relationships of the hammerheads, scallop heads, and bonnet heads? And uh, is there any, like, trend in the size of the, the hammer, the cephalofoil going on? So we used to think that the smaller-headed um, hammerheads were the older ones and that it grew progressively longer. However, it's actually been found that the most primitive or the most basal hammerhead, which is the winghead shark, which has the longest head, those are actually, I mean, those are the most basal. So they most likely had a longer um, elongated head that narrowed down rather than them being smaller and going larger. That's very interesting. Uh, Next, uh, we got Jillian asks, can you recommend a good book that covers both extant or living and fossil sharks. So if you can find it, Capetta 2012 is a good one. It's important to note that while some information may be valid from now, it may be invalid a month from now. So since it's constantly evolving, it's really just collecting as many modern publications as you can. But with that said, I think that a great starting place is Capetta 2012. If you want an older one, Capetta 1987 is good as well, though some of it is outdated. Uh, Sam Fisher asks, do saw sharks and sawfish have the same number of enameloid layers in their rostral teeth? So they they don't. So sawfish have different um, rostral teeth entirely that aren't as enameled, whereas um, sclerorhynchids tend to have a more similar type to Prissy Fords, although I'm not entirely sure on the histology tests that have been done between the saw, the extinct sawfish and the saw sharks. That sounds like a good research idea, Sam. Yeah. Uh, so next, uh, Isat asks, bioluminescent sharks, do they glow due to symbiotic bacteria or do they have their own like bioluminescence going on? That is a good question that I cannot answer. <laughs> I, I do not know, unfortunately. All right, that's uh, all we have for for questions in chat. Uh, does anyone have any last minute ones or want to raise their hand? I have a question. How um, so I, I mentioned this also, but the, we had a little March Madness going on to pick what shark we were going to highlight for Shark Fest this year, and it was the whale shark. And I didn't realize that we could find whale shark teeth in Maryland. Um, I'm new to the, this whole thing. <clears throat> How easy is it to find whale shark tooth and teeth in, in Maryland? And does anybody have any that we could borrow? And what is micro screening when you go out there? So whale shark teeth, I would assume, would be fairly uncommon within uh, Maryland. So micro screening is pretty much where you take a um, you take some sort of filter, so like a screen that is just essentially set smaller so that you can catch more small teeth in it. Um, but yeah, so whale shark teeth, they wouldn't be too common, I would assume, but I've never personally collected in Maryland to find them. I can tell you they are rather rare. Yeah. I haven't seen too many, I can say that. You can find more of them in Lee Creek in North Carolina. 
Uh, Nick Gardner asks, what, uh, is there any book you would recommend on fossil sharks for a general reference collection in a public library, like for non-specialists, just a uh, layman? Um, that's tough. I really don't know any off of the top of my head. I mean, my, my recommendation would be to get one of the Capetta books and just have a, um, just copy and paste all the words you don't know. That's pretty much what I did and research that way. But you can still look at, so Capetta 2012 has lots of diagrams and stuff like that. Even if you don't want to read all of the scientific lingual, you can still look at the pictures and compare through that. Do you have, do you know of any um, posters or resources that you've come across that, sh that I mean, it, it basically is how you did your presentation where you have the different orders and then you have examples of the teeth because I thought that that was very well done and it's, it's very, um, I think informative to show uh, people the, that the, the diversity there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen any, I haven't seen any others that are really like that. There is a couple other presentations online that you can find. One of them is from, I think, Dan Bowen, who did who did a presentation on the late Cretaceous of Hornby Island, Canada. So you'll see a lot of the taxa that I talked about on there. But I haven't seen anything else really that would be that, um, that would have that type of compilation of every single shark order which is really why I wanted to focus on this because there's lots of stuff for specific groups, but not so much for just everything on a broader sense. Uh, Jillian asks, uh, says that they don't remember the name of the specific fossil shark, but wasn't there one that had a jaw that was shaped like a circular saw? Uh, that would be the cookie cutter shark. Would that be that one? The one that has those lower teeth that are kind of like a conveyor belt I think they're going for a Helia Caprion. Oh, the world tooth shark? Oh yeah, so those, those are actually um, eugenodoniforms. So those are more related to ratfish. They're within the eucondrocephalians. So they used to be considered sharks, but even though they have a shark-like body plan, they're not true sharks. But yeah, that's Helicoprion. Looks like Rodney has a question. Hey, um, Carcharodon hastilis, uh is not a mako? Uh, that is correct, unless if you wanted to call uh, Carcharodon carcarius a mako as well. So, so I got a lot of labels to change. <laughs> uh, um, so where would the makos fall? What, what are they considered now? So are they back they to are... What? Are they back to the uh, um, genus Isurus? They were Cosmopolitotus and... All so, that. Yeah, so I would consider them still within Carcharodon. With the great whites, it's a lot harder to change a genus name with extant species than it is with extinct ones because you'll upset a lot more people doing so. <laughs> so technically, you can still change the great white to become a mako by calling it Asurus, and it wouldn't technically be wrong as it'll still be monophyletic. However, we still like to split them because there are enough differences mm -hmm. between them. So I would call them Carcharodon, as well as Hestalis and all of the sharks that predicated it or that went before it. Okay. Um, sharks. Just, uh, Makos. Yeah. So Makos and Great Whites essentially diverged in the Oligocene. Mm -hmm. We have an ancestral shark in the Eocene through earliest Oligocene, which is called Macroizotis which comes from Isura lamna most likely, which makes it in of itself a paraphile. So that will need to be revised in the future. But that's pretty much the shark that gave rise to both groups. Mm -hmm. All right, now I'm really confused. <laughs> <laughs> so All essentially, right. great whites and, Ma and makos are sister to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> Uh, we got another question from Jillian uh, asks, is the great white shark uh, warm-blooded and was Megalodon warm-blooded? I believe the great white is warm-blooded and I do think that the Megalodon would have been as well. There's a, there's a question from Sam. 
Yeah, Sam asks, where do taxa like Xenacanthus fall out? So this is going to be a bit of a controversy, but they are considered what's called a diplodont tooth, which is kind they're related to the cladodontomorphs, which are those classic Paleozoic teeth that have that one central cusplet and then those other ones that are laterally to the side of it. But they essentially, you have within elasmobranchi, they're either considered elasmobranchs or stem chondrichthians in their entirety. So it really all depends on what, what type of, um, what, what your impression is of it, because you have different paleontologists that disagree all the time on it. Some people think that they're stem chondrichthians, whereas others think that they're elasmobranchs closely related to the sharks. But it, it's a bit of a controversy. I have a question. <clears throat> does the rostrum of the goblin shark, does that fossilize or is it, or is it just cartilage as well? So I believe they have fossilized remains of Scapanorhynchus, which is a goblin shark-like relative, which is from the Cretaceous. You can find those all over in the US, but I don't believe that we have found a a fossilized articulated skeleton of the genus Mitsicorina, which is the extant goblin sharks. Are there any other okay. questions? I think that might be it. If anybody has another question, thank you so much, Ben. This has been fabulous. The, the reviews are already in and we want you back. So give us some more information <laughs> later. Thank so, you. I'm, um, I'm glad you do this. Yeah, this was a wonderful presentation and um, we all learned a lot. I do want to make a, make, make a quick announcement. Next month's meeting is going to be in person at the, at the museum. We will have a hybrid virtual tie-in option, um, uh, but we, we want to get people together. So next month we're going to get together at the museum. That would be June 1st, um, June 1st meeting. So we can all get together, but we will also have a hybrid and we'll probably be dealing with again with sharks because it's Shark Fest, getting pre prepared for Shark Fest. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, everybody stay well, stay curious. And uh, that's it. Good night, everybody. Thanks for the time.